Father Deacon. Yes. I take the call. Uh, no, he could stay. All right. I think we're ready, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right, let's 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 begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. All right. Thank you, number one, for being here. Um, I know with especially having, you know, newborn kids, um, schedules are crazy. Um, their own lives. I mean, they're just learning how to live life right now. So they, they, they're not on any schedule. Um, they're cranky. They're hungry. They're tired. Um, and that's the parents and the baby. So thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to be here. Uh, but it is important because baptism is the gateway sacrament to, and opens the doors of grace to all the other sacraments. So if you don't get something right in the beginning, if you don't understand the great grace of baptism, then all the other sacraments are going to be too much of a mystery. Of course, it's, all the sacraments are mysteries, but we got to nail this first one and get it right and understand what God is doing in and through the sacrament of baptism. So it's good for everybody to be here. Parents, godparents, those joining us on Zoom. Hello, everybody on Zoom. Glad you could make it. Um, so I'm going to try to move as quickly as possible. Um, I do want to give the floor to you guys because you're in the trenches. So the questions that you have, feel free to interrupt. Let me know, and I'll be happy to stop and answer questions. But um, there's a lot of material, so I do want to move kind of quickly. Um, but first and foremost, congratulations. You just had a new baby, baby boy, baby girl. That's amazing, incredible. You did? That's awesome. Um, life has changed. You know, life has changed. My wife and I have six kids. Um, and every new child, your life changes a little bit. And so this is a great beginning to a brand new adventure. That's going to take a lot of time, a lot of tears, a lot of sweat, and a lot of money, but it's all worth it um, because the child is made in the image and likeness of God. God has given you a gift. Um, and so you as parents, your job, you know, you've brought new life into the world. You know already babies take a lot of time to nurture, to feed, to clothe, to bathe, to change. That's your primary role as parents right now. But don't forget about your baby's spiritual needs. Sometimes we can be so focused on our baby's physical needs because they're evident because you hear them. You hear them crying. Oh, they're hungry. They need to change. Right? And that's our world as parents. But also your child's spiritual needs. And that's why you're here. You're here to address your child's spiritual needs in and through baptism. Right? You're coming to church, presenting your child to be baptized, right? Um, and also, as, as parents, it's so important to, re to remember throughout your child's development that at every stage, they need spiritual attention. And I've seen you all here at St. George, so you're active parishioners, you're coming here, they're going to be able to receive communion, right? Because we put all three sacraments of initiation to, together, baptism, chrismation, and Eucharist. So you're, you're going to be, your child is going to be nourished on the grace of, of the sacraments from the get-go, which is amazing. It's an incredible blessing. Um, there are no adult converts here, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but even them, they become spiritual babies when they get baptized. So that's kind of cool. All right. Now, why do we be begin with baptism? Whole long big quote, don't worry about it. But St. Peter talks about that baptism now saves you. So this is the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 3. So we as Christians, in the Old Covenant, it was males were saved by circumcision, right? And you were saved as part of the people of Israel. 
new covenant, Christ comes, and he gives us the sacrament of baptism. He sets it up for us when he goes down into the Jordan and accepts baptism at the hands of his cousin John, right? Jesus didn't need to be baptized, right? He's the sinless one. He's, he's, he's God from all eternity. He didn't need to be baptized. So if God is doing something that he doesn't need to do, it's for our benefit, right? He sets up the sacrament of baptism for us. And that's, you know, that's our signpost saying, hey, this is, you know, Jesus begins his ministry with baptism. We begin our ministry as Christians in and through baptism. And so it's no longer circumcision that saves us, it's baptism, right? And we see this often through the Old Testament, just a couple of examples of being saved through water, right? If you remember uh, Noah, right? Noah and the ark, right? God says, I'm going to make it rain, get everybody onto the ark, okay? And it's through the water, it's through being saved through the water that humanity is able to continue and flourish. With Moses taking the people of, of Israel through the Red Sea, right? They walk through the Red Sea as on dry land. Column of water to the left, column of water to the right. They're being saved through the water, right? So there's men, there's that's called biblical typology, where God does something in the Old Testament that's a shadow. It's an image of what Jesus is going to bring to fulfillment in the New Testament. So God is, is con, you know, this wasn't a surprise that God uses that symbolism of water in order to convey salvation, right? Because baptism is a washing, it's a renewal, right? It's the beginning of something new. And so often, you know, that, that you know, when you start something new again, you know, that being cleansed, that being washed prepares you for the entry into new life. Okay, so that's what baptism is. And God's prepared that sacramental system from Old Testament, New Testament. Okay. Oh, somebody's joining. That's wonderful. Good. All right. So the reason why we need baptism in the first place. So Adam and Eve, going back to our first parents, right? And y'all are parents, right? So Adam and Eve are the first parents, right? God makes Adam and Eve in his image and in his likeness. He puts them in the Garden of Eden. They have everything that they need, okay? They have what's called original justice and original holiness. They didn't need anything, and God was right there in the Garden with them, providing for all their needs. And of course, we, we know what happened. Genesis chapter 3 is Eve takes the edge. She enters into dialogue with the serpent, takes the fruit, eats of it, and that's the original sin, quote-unquote. It wasn't so much the taking of the fruit. Of course, there's, there's heavy, heavy symbolism in the book of Genesis. It's God gave them a law. God said, don't do this. I'm taking care of anything, everything you need anyway. So you don't need to go bothering with this tree. Just don't. And of course, you know, and you're going to know as parents as you grow, when you set the law down, first thing they do is break the law first thing every single time it's like it's it's like it's coded in our humanity or something which is what genesis is getting at right and this is the great struggle of humanity is god gives us a law and the first thing we want to do is break it all right so adam and eve lost all those gifts that god had originally given them right and so this is what we call ancestral sin. In our Eastern, Eastern Catholic tradition, we use the term ancestral sin. In the West, they use the term original sin. We're really talking about the same thing. It's as human beings, we inherit a fallen nature, right? We struggle with sin. We struggle with temptation. We struggle in life in general, okay? Um, so the, the whole footing of becoming a Christian is taking care of this, taking care of our woundedness, right? Um, we all deal with woundedness in our lives. If we let the wound fester and we don't take care of it, whether it's an emotional wound, a spiritual wound, a psychological wound, if we don't take care of the wound, then we can't, we struggle in relationship with, with ourselves and with others going forward, right? And we, we know this as adults. And so in terms of 
our walk with Christ, we don't want that woundedness to get in the way of our relationship with Christ. So baptism is that first step in healing that wound, right? Because God is going to apply the medicine of grace to our souls and restore us to right relationship with God in and through the water of baptism. It's it's really, it's a fantastic gift because we start off that relationship with God on the right foot. We get those gifts, those graces that Adam and Eve said no to. We restore that those graces back with baptism. So it's it's really a wonderful, wonderful gift because we want our children, even as infants, to be friends of God. And this, this is the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand, but our Eastern Catholic tradition understands very well, is that you don't have to understand things to receive God's grace. I mean, we're talking about God. Okay, How do the sacraments work? How do the, the divine mysteries work? How does grace work in my soul? I have no idea. I'm a deacon, for crying out loud. I have no idea. It's a mystery. That's why we use that, that term mystery about all the sacraments, right? How does God work in my soul? It's beyond me. I don't have the language for it, right? And so your children, even though they're infants, they don't need to know. They don't need to understand it with their brains, right? They need to participate, right? Christ has given us these sacramental mysteries to participate in. And it's not based on our knowledge, like it's a reward. Oh, I got an A-plus on the test. Now I can go to the sacraments. It's no. You're part of the community. Come, bring your children. Have them receive communion every time. If they get fussy, don't worry about it. You know, the deacons are, we're, we tend to be pretty patient. Father Justin, eh, you know, he's, he's, got, he's got his, no, he's pretty patient with kids too. No, it's it's really, it's more important for them to be participating than saying, well, no, you don't understand yet. Now that's, God doesn't test us that way. All right. So as I had already mentioned, you know, Jesus sets up this the mystery of baptism when he's baptized in the Jordan. So we all know this. This is right by our baptismal font, right? So when you're standing there and your child is being baptized, that icon of the baptism is right there. And it's a reminder of what Christ has done for us. Uh, and of course, uh, during the procession, we sing, all of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Right, Christ has come to dwell in your child, right? And you're they're clothed in Christ, right? That's what that white garment symbolizes. And so it's that it's that beautiful initiation into friendship with Christ. That's what baptism is. Um, it's it's the configuration of the soul based on the life of the Holy Trinity brought into the soul. Everything we do is Trinitarian. Right, we we you know we say the glory be multiple times throughout the liturgies. Everything is trinitarian, and so Christ in setting up the sacrament of baptism for us brings us the Father, and then of course we know part of the sacrament is also the the mystery of chrismation, the sealing in of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it's very much a trinitarian event that your children will be going through. Right and and that full dwelling of the life of God in their souls again beyond our understanding and comprehension that's not what it's about it's it's that indwelling of the Holy Trinity in your child restores us to friendship with God solves that ancient curse of ancestral sin it does all these wonderful things makes you part of God's family right your child is part of your family right physically right your parents. You've got parents, you've got grandparents, you've got extended family, right? There's a family according to the flesh, and that's wonderful. But your child becomes a member of God's family with baptism, right? Become adopted sons and daughters of God, right? And if we're adopted sons and daughters of God, that means we're heirs to all of the promises that God has given to us, including eternal life. Right Again, parents give physical life to their children, but through in and through the mysteries of the church, especially the mysteries of, of initiation, God makes us members of his family right, and points us towards his kingdom. Um, and that's a relationship that never ends. Right, We get our children for a limited amount of time here on this earth. 
right? They're in our house. We raise them. We do the best we can. But at a point, you let them go. And they live their own life based on what God is calling them to. But all of us, all of the baptized are members of the family of God. And we're going to be re reunited as members of the family of God in eternity and live that eternal life together, which I think is a really, really beautiful image to have. Right? It's that family life that never ends. Right? It's also the beginning of our walk in theosis. Right? And this is, as Eastern Catholics, we talk about this a lot. Right? We're growing in the grace of God. Right? Grace is given, but it's meant to be grown. Right? The sacraments of initiation, that life, right? Think of it like a seed, right? A seed contains life within it. But a seed needs to be cultivated and grown. It needs water. It needs sunlight. And this is their continued life in the church, right? So yeah, that seed's got life in it. But you as parents and godparents, you provide the water and the sunlight by bringing your children and godchildren to church so that they continue that life of grace. They're continuing to grow. Um, godparents, it's really important that you're praying for your godchildren every day, right? And your prayers, God takes those prayers and he uses them like water to help them grow in that life of grace. We good? Any questions so, so far? All right, I know I'll move them through pretty quick. Of course, we want this for our children. This is a great, great blessing and great gift. Okay, now what does baptism do? So we've already kind of touched on these things, but it's worth saying again. Baptism is a dying and rising with Christ. That's why we in the East do baptism through immersion, because the symbolism is there, right? It's a, you know, baby under the water, out of the water. It's a dying and a rising, right? And that symbolism is important, right? Sometimes people kind of, well, symbolism is not really important because it's not the real thing. But we're human beings, right? You know, sometimes we need things to be simplified for us. And so God gives us sacramental sacramental signs and symbols in order to kind of shake our reality and go, oh, that's what that means. So in our church, we use water, right? For chrismation, we use oil. For Eucharist, we use bread and wine. These are all symbols. But the symbols become what they symbolize. So we just experienced divine, the divine liturgy. So the bread and wine are symbols, but they become what they symbolize, the body and blood of Christ, right? Water, yeah, you know, we, we drink water, we bathe in water, but when it's sacramental, it becomes what it symbolizes. So the water is a dying and rising, right? A, the water becomes what is a symbol of washing, becomes washing by the grace of the Holy Spirit, Okay. So that's how those sacramental signs and symbols work. Also, our attachment to sin is broken. All those things that Adam and Eve lost in the garden, that woundedness, right? That woundedness that we inherit from our Adam and Eve, our first parents, that's washed away. Now, of course, the struggle with sin continues, right? But that's where the grace that's given through the sacrament, especially every time you bring your child to, to communion, every time a godparent says a prayer, I'm praying for my God, all of those graces God is able to work with and apply to your child, to your godchild, to help them grow in grace, which is a struggle, but it's a struggle worth having, right? We receive the white garment, right? That's that symbol of the light of Christ coming to dwell in the soul. That's why it's white. That's why it's bright, right? And so again, the symbol, right? What we can't, what we can see, we can see the white garment. What we can't see is the soul, but the soul is illuminated. And that we you hear this so many times in our in the baptismal rite, holy illumination. That's what we call it, holy illumination. We can't see the light in the child. That's what that white garment symbolizes, right? So the symbol becomes what it symbolizes. And it's it's for our benefits, for our sake, right? Grace of baptism allows a person to mature and grow in, in faith and good works. The light of faith symbolized by the reception of the lit candle. Again, we pile on the symbols. You know, we we in the East, we never take stuff away, right? We pile them on. And so your the parents and godparents are going to have that lit candle 
throughout the ceremony and then even in the divine liturgy you've got that lit candle right it's that that light of faith that is now burning in your child and god child that's what that that candle symbolizes and again these symbols are for our sake to remind us of what's going on right what god is doing invisibly we have the signs and symbols so that we can see them and then also put your child's baptismal candle someplace where they can see it at home don't put it aside in a keepsake box that they never get to see and maybe they get the box when they leave home and start their own home don't do that they need to see their baptismal candle they need to see you know like for at, at, at my house we've got them up on the mantle right so they can see their baptismal candles and be reminded when they're at home of that great gift that they've been given in baptism right that's part of the extension of the sacrament even in the life of the home because we can forget but if it's right there we're, we're reminded all right now kind of getting into the little bit of the nitty-gritty of what are what are we actually going to do when it comes time for the baptism well to begin with there's a rite that's called the catechumenate right for if there are any adult converts here they would be considered catechumens okay kids you know they're catechumens for like 10 minutes that's it um but in the ancient church because the majority of christians were coming into the church as adults they had a 40-day period called the catechumenate and then they went through instruction and they went through you know different prayers and then they were baptized holy saturday evening right basically what we do for the hajmi right that's way too busy we couldn't do we couldn't do baptisms that night um but in the ancient church they used to baptize everybody holy saturday evening right so your child will be a catechumen for about 10 minutes so there's what's called the re reception of the catechumen okay this is the one okay if you have people who are coming to church who are either family but they're not familiar with our melkite tradition or if they're roman catholic or if they're protestant or whatever they're going to hear the word exorcism several times okay and they might start to freak out like what is what are you doing like this child does not have the devil what is that about and father justin does a really great job explaining to people that we don't believe your child has the devil and that's why we're going to do three exorcism prayers it's these these prayers of exorcism are a claiming of the child for christ and it's very clear in the prayers that we're not saying there's anything wrong with your baby god no it's moving towards baptism. We are now claiming this child for Christ. And where Christ is, the devil has no influence. That's the point of these prayers. So you might have to calm people down if they're coming from a different faith tradition, right? Uh, and Father Justin, I have never been to a baptism that he's done where he hasn't explained this. Because it is important. Because it could be scandalous for people hearing, you know, you know. Yes, your baby does throw up a lot, but it's not pea soup, okay? All right. But again, the emphasis is, no, this child is being claimed for Christ. And where Christ is, the devil cannot be. That's the important thing. And that's also a beautiful thing as well. That once your child is baptized and chrismated, the devil is no has no power, has no authority, has no influence over that child. Becomes a little bit different later on when they reach the age of reason and they have to start making moral choices for their own. They're going to fall, no doubt. We all do. Okay? But it's that if they're used to that life of grace, that life of grace is going to sustain them. Okay? Um, so that's the first part of the baptism ritual is the rite of the catechumenate. And again, it includes three prayers of exorcism. All right. And then the next part, involves and this is cool so godparents and parents so baptism we start in the back of the church we start right by the the doors of the church so you'll be standing there and originally you'll be facing you'll be facing the east right you'll be facing the icon screen and then at a point father's going to say all right we're going to renounce satan 
That's a good thing. And then there's a profession of faith. And then he's going to say, all right, turn around and face the West. Right? So parents and godparents are going to turn around, face the West. Because in our, again, symbolism is important for us because it makes connections in our brains. So the East is the rising sun. Right? The East is towards Jerusalem. The East is where Christ is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Right? East is good. West, not so good. That's where the sun sets. That's where the darkness comes from. Again, these are symbols for our benefit. Okay? So, Father Justin's going to ask parents, godparents, to turn towards the West. Okay? So, from the East to the West. This is a, a metanoia. Okay? We make a metany in church. We bow down, make the sign of the cross. Metany just means turn, or, turn around. That's all it means. All right? And then, of course, the wonderful part that Father Justin always highlights, let us blow and spit on Satan. Don't spit on the floor. It's a, you know, good Greek custom, you know. Um, but it's, again, that symbolism of we're getting ready, we're turning from our old life, we're turning from darkness back towards the light. And the gateway to that turning is the creed, which is why we pray it at this point. Here's the faith I'm professing. This faith that I'm professing is rooted in Christ. Christ is the light. So that's why that the, the creed is involved in this, this part of the ritual. Okay? All right. So here's just kind of the, the dialogue, which I already kind of spoiled, spoiled it, which is fine. And again, you know, don't actually spit on the church floor, please and thank you. Um, but it goes from renouncing the devil, his works, his influences, to have you united yourself to Christ? Notice we ask that question even before the child hits the water. And the, the parents and godparents answer, right? Baptism is rooted in the, in the faith of the parents and the godparents. Right? You're making this answer on behalf of your child or godchild. Right? You know, oftentimes we live in the South, very Protestant South. And well, why do you all baptize infants? You know, they haven't made the decision for themselves. Well, again, it's root, our life of faith is, you know, we make these, you know, we the parents and godparents stand in the place of the child. Right? It's their act of faith. And of course, you want to do the most loving thing you can for your, your child and godchild. So you bring them to embrace baptism. You know, St. Paul, when he was doing his ministry, you know, Paul wrote, you know, all, basically most of the New Testament. He's baptizing entire households, right? That means women, children, young, old, didn't matter. Everybody was being baptized. Again, it's not about our understanding. It's about our faith. Right, our faith allows us to approach the holy mysteries, and so we go from renouncing Satan to have you united yourself to Christ. And this is also an important question for you as parents and godparents to ask yourself every day. Actually, every time you pray in the morning and the in the evening, which I hope you do, ask yourself that question: Have I united myself to Christ today? Some days, yeah, it's a struggle. Absolutely. Right? Because Jesus, yeah, he says, pick up your cross and, and follow me. That's tough, especially when you're taking care of a family. Right? But all of you who approach the mystery of holy crowning together, right, implicit in that is we're going to help one another carry our crosses. So remember this part and ask yourself and pray this. Pray this with your children as they grow up and they're starting to learn their prayers. And ask them, have you united yourself to Christ today? That's a prayer. That's a prayerful, prayerful thing. So remember that. Oh, one thing I should mention. Again, Father Justin's going to bring it up. He loves making fun of parents and godparents who can't say the word consubstantial. You can do it. I know you're all educated people, but just consubstantial. He'll go through it. It's it's easy. 
he's never stopped a baptism because he's been laughing that hard. So just consubstantial. We say it every Sunday. All right. After, so this that concludes the rite of the catechumenate. And then we go into the rite of baptism. It begins with, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. The same way we begin divine liturgy is the same way we begin, begin the rite of baptism. Right? Because we're no longer in the world, we're entering into God's kingdom. That's why we say, blessed is the kingdom. Right? In church lingo, it's called kairos time. Right? There's our time in the world, which we measure usually nowadays with our phones to tell us what time it is, or with a wristwatch. But when we are in church for divine liturgy or for the ritual of baptism, we enter into God's time. God's time is timeless, right? And so we're entering into the kingdom because your child is now entering into the kingdom, right? And that, that's a timeless kind of time. The deacon has a litany, okay? And then... Father Justin will bless the baptismal font with the hand cross. He says, let all adverse powers be crushed beneath the sign of this cross. Right? He's calling down the Holy Spirit upon the water to sanctify the water, just like Jesus did at the Jordan. Jesus goes into the water to make the water holy so that we can use it for baptism. Right, and if you look at the Jordan, the Jordan feeds into the Mediterranean. The Jordan, the Mediterranean feeds into the Atlantic. I mean, that sanctification of the water was not just for that little tiny area of the Jordan that Jesus happened to be in. This was the waters of the world. This is why when we do the great uh, blessing of water for Holy Theophany, it's very much the same thing that all of the water of the world is being blessed. Well, why? So we can baptize. Okay. He'll pour the oil of the catechumens into the water, okay, which is cool. Um, he anoints your child with the oil of the catechumens and then pours a little into the font. The oil of the catechumens is also called the oil of gladness. Hello. Um, no trouble. Come on. And of course, this is a glad event. This is a happy event. So that's why we call it the oil of gladness. Okay. Baptism, as I said, we dunk. It's immersion. Um, the servant of God is baptized in the name of the Father, one dunk, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you guys have been to baptisms before. Father Justin's a pro. He's not going to lose your baby. Okay. He's never lost a baby to the bottom of the font. Um, it'll be absolutely fine. Your child will cry. Most every most all the babies that are dunked, they cry. Um, that's fine. Okay, that's that's natural. That's what that's just what's gonna happen, what's good, what they're gonna do. Um, godparents. Okay, let me make it practical for a second. You're gonna have a towel. Usually the godfather does this part. Okay, you're gonna have a big old bath towel. Father Justin, he says the same thing every I'm the pitcher, you're the catcher. So once he says the Holy Spirit, okay, out of the font, over to Godfather, Godmother, whoever is catching, and then you start to dry off the baby. So very, very practical. But from the font, so just be ready to catch is what I'm saying. Um, and then child will be dried off, put a diaper back on, and then whatever baptismal garment you've you've gotten for your child, put them on, get them, get them all dressed up. Um Keep maybe if if you have like booties or socks or whatever that you want to put on, you you can do that. That's fine. Um, just be aware that part of the chrismation is anointing the feet. Um, so you might have to roll down some socks or take a booty off. If if it's if you don't, Father will just anoint their ankle. It's not a big deal. It's in the vicinity. God knows what He's doing anyway. So it it's all good. But that's the actual rite of baptism. All right. We good? Any questions? All right. If you're happy to keep rolling, I'm, I'm happy to keep rolling. All right. Immediately following the baptism is the chrismation. Okay. Um, chrismation in the East, confirmation in the West. They delay it until later in life. We do it right up front um, because you're a new creation in Christ. 
And then why would we wait? You know, we want your child to have the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So biblically, where do we get this? Acts chapter 2. Right. God sends this the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and the Theotokos of Pentecost. And then they go out. They immediately go from hiding in the upper room because they're terrified. Christ just was put on the cross. And yeah, he's kind of walking around and he's risen from the dead, but they're not sure what to do yet. They're still terrified that the Romans are going to come kill them all. That's why they're in hiding. But after Pentecost, they go out to proclaim, right? That's the point. That's why we give your children the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? Again, it's not about what they understand. Children are among the best proclaimers of the gospel. I've seen more faith come out of children than out of adults, time and time again, especially when it comes to Holy Communion. I've heard more kids get excited to go up and receive our Lord in Communion, and you ask them, well, well what, is, what is Communion? They say, it's Jesus. They don't need a big theological explanation. We as adults, we get dumb. We want to know more. You know, we think, oh, it's Jesus. That's not enough. It's like there's more faith. And this is why Jesus in the gospels, he points to the faith of children more often than he points to the faith of adults. Right? Children, they are witnesses and proclaimers of the gospel. Absolutely 100 percent No doubt in my mind. I've seen it dozens of times. Okay. It's we as adults that we get gummed up and, you know, we get confused. And so your child is tasked with proclaiming the gospel, and they will do so. They absolutely will, will do so. You know, being a parent of six kids, I can testify to the fact that I've heard my youngest kids proclaim greater theology to me than any of my theology. I, I have two degrees in theology. I've heard out of their mouths more wisdom than I've heard from any of my theology teachers. They're they're fairly kids are fairly remarkable. Um and that's going to impact your faith as as a parent and a godparent too to watch them proclaim the gospel to you. Um and so they receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. They receive that bodily anointing and this, this takes us back even to the Old Testament, where there are three, three classes of people in the Old Testament who are anointed. Priests, prophets, and kings. Those were the ones who were anointed in the Old Testament. And so, chrismation anoints your child as priest, because they're going to be able to offer their own prayers to God, right? As they grow up and as they learn to pray, by your example— they offer their own prayers to God. Prophet, so part of the prophetic mission is to proclaim the good news. That's what the prophets did. And I already said, I've seen more kids proclaim the good news than a lot of adults. And then king, a king rules. So at a point, your child is going to take ownership over their own lives and start making their own decisions. But if they start making their own decisions by the grace of the Holy Spirit, they're going to make good decisions. Not 100% of the time. This isn't magic, okay? But if they're if they're living with the grace of God in the soul, they're going to make good decisions 99.9% .9 of the time. Okay. So that's all of us. So your children are entering into what we all are called to do as Christians. We're all called to act as priest, prophet, and king. Okay. As I already said, they receive, they receive the lit candle. Parents, godparents, you'll receive that, and you'll carry that with you. And then Father will say, keep this light burning throughout your life so that when Christ returns, you can greet them. Okay? You re <clears throat> Excuse me, just one second. Hey, Welcome. So you get the lit candle. There's a procession around the church. There's an epistle reading up at the front. So right before the holy doors, there's an epistle reading. There's a gospel reading. So 
again, practical. What Father likes to do is he'll take the gospel book and he'll hold it right over the head of the child. He's not going to drop it. Okay? But again, it's the light of the gospel overshadowing and coming, coming down on the child. So again, it's that symbolism. Yeah. If we have time, we'll do the tonsure right there. Oftentimes we tonsure at the end of Divine Liturgy, just because we ran out of time. But it's that offering of the hair. Okay. In the Old Testament, that was a that was an offering. Okay. So the first offering of your child will be their hair. Okay. Why do we do that? Again, it happened in the Old Testament. That's why we kind of carried it through to the new. Um, priests, so deacons, priests, uh, monks, and nuns are all tantric, right? So when I was made a, a reader, they cut my hair. Um, it's Again, it's just that I'm giving something to God. I'm taking from what God has given me, and I'm giving it back to God. That's the symbolism there, okay? Um, again, practical. It, you, so um, parents and godparents, whenever we tonsure, the deacon will put it in a little envelope. Be sure to see either myself or Father Andrew at the end, and we will give it to you. Again, nice keepsake. Okay, you can put it in their baby book. All right. The climax of all of this is your child's reception of Holy Communion at the Divine Liturgy. So they've been cleansed and purified by the waters of baptism. They've put on Christ. They've received the light of Christ. Okay. They've been sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And now they're going to receive Christ for the first time in Holy Communion. Practical, you're first. Okay. Baby is first on the day of their baptism. So they'll be called up first, and Father will dip his finger into the precious blood and just touch it to their lips. Okay? So very easy, simple. Um, and then the parents and godparents will receive next. Okay? And so all of this comes from, you know, of course, we're, we're fed on the bread of the Eucharist every Sunday. Right? Um, sun, you know, gathering together as a community for the divine liturgy is the, the pinnacle of what we do every week as Christians. <clears throat> so, what the Lord set up for us at the Last Supper, and we, you really get this if you're here Holy Week, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the connection. What He does for us on Holy Thursday by, by giving us the bread and the wine at the Last Supper made sense the next day in giving us his body and blood on the cross, okay? And that's what we celebrate every single Sunday, right? Because it's through the body and blood of Christ that our souls are nourished, right? You're taking care of every part of your child's nourishment right now, okay? They're spiritually nourished at the table of the Eucharist every week. And please, bring them every week. As much as you can, you know, if, if they're sick or whatever, kids get sick all the time, but every, try to make it every, every week. Because again, you wouldn't let your child go a day without eating, right? Don't let them go a week without coming to Holy Communion, okay? Because it's the life, you know, Jesus says, he who e eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As parents and godparents, that should be number one. That's what I want for my child. I want Christ to abide and dwell in my child and be with them as they grow in their in their Christian walk of faith. Okay, so that's why we keep those three sacraments together: baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist. It's about establishing that relationship with God and then nourishing it at the table of the at the, at the table of the Eucharist. And this is just a really cool quote by St. John Damascene, but but basically, you know, burning coal is not plain wood, but wood united with fire in like manner. The bread of communion is not plain bread, but bread united with divinity, right? We believe that the bread and wine don't remain bread and wine. They become the body and blood of Christ, okay? Um, because that's the way Jesus set it up for us. Right? And so, of course, we want our child to receive that partaking of the divine nature, that theosis, 
that ongoing transformation, that ongoing growth in the Christian life, right? You're going to get, every time you take your child to the doctor for a checkup, they're going to tell you what percentile they're in, height, weight, and all that stuff. Great. Doesn't matter. Your child is your child. Um, unfortunately, we don't give out a, well, here's, here's how they're doing in theosis chart because we can't see that. Okay, but that's the most important growth that they're going to be doing, right? And as long as you're part of this community and cultivating that life of faith, it's it's going to be there. It's going to be there. Okay. Now we're getting down to some really, really practical stuff. You've already got names picked out for your kids. Great. Whatever saint you've picked that's their patron, get an icon. Put the icon in the room or in your icon corner. Get an icon of their guardian angel to put it by wherever they sleep. Put it there. We don't pick the, you know, some sometimes we pick a name because it's a family name. Sometimes we pick a name because we have a devotion to a particular saint. Whatever the reasoning, don't make the name that you've chosen for your child just, oh, I picked it because it's pretty. Right? Connect it to somebody. Connect it to a saint. And then tell that saint's story to your child as they're growing up so that they have a role model. They have a model to follow after. That's so important. We decorate our church with icons of saints, right? That's not just for decoration. That's because they're there praying with us. You put an icon in your child's room, that saint is there watching over your child, right? This is the faith of our church, that icons are windows to heaven, right? And so do that. I mean, it's real simple, real simple to just do that and make sure... Make sure to tell that story, okay, to give them that example. Um, if for some reason you don't have a name picked out or you're still, like, struggling with the middle name, um, orthodoxwiki.org has some baptismal names, which are really cool, um, and it ties it with the story of the saint, too. So uh, that's just there for you for practical, practical life. Okay, now down into the nitty gritty, and we're we're kind of getting we're getting towards the end. Okay, so as you know, it's our parish policy that one of the godparents has to be a parishioner. Okay, again, practical. You're bringing your child here. You're a godparent. Godparent gets to see their godchild every Sunday. Right, that's beautiful. That's awesome. So it's it's about cultivating that relationship with their godparents. Uh, I know some churches don't have that policy, right? And then what happens is, you know, godchild and godparent kind of drift apart. That's not the way things are supposed to be, okay? So one of you, uh, one of the godparents has to be a parishioner. We've got towels. Don't worry about that. But if you want, like, a keepsake towel, if you want to bring your own, you can bring your own. But we we do have towels, um, but that's there as an option if you want to bring a towel to, you know, just as a keepsake. Baptismal candles, um, see seraphim shop for those. Okay. Some parents and godparents like to buy their own. Um, there's tons of stuff you can find online. Um, and then ask seraphim shop. They've they've got baptismal candles too. Again, the uh, white baptismal garment, if you're struggling to find that. Again, tons of stuff online. Our own in-house seraphim shop can help you out. No trouble there. Um, nobody's being baptized as an adult, but um, there's a whole protocol for that too. But um, yeah, it, it's amazing what you can find online. And please do take some time. Also, a baptismal cross. Um, oftentimes, right after the baptism, if you have a baptismal cross, Father will bless that in the water that your child was just baptized in. That's kind of cool. So that's also a custom uh, you don't have to have a cross, but again, it's a custom that we like. Um, so go online, find the stuff that you need. If you need help, you know, call me, call Father Andrew, call Seraphim Shop. We'll get it squared away. No trouble. But again, it's about having these things as reminders of the day, right? If, if you get an icon for your child, bring it and we'll bless it right there. 
during the divine liturgy. Okay, so it's really whatever you need to be equipped to have those holy reminders around you of this wonderful, wonderful event. And then just in conclusion, the day of your child or your godchild's baptism is a day that you should remember for the rest of your lives. You know, certainly moms and dads remember the day that their child was born, right? Because long, long period of labor, it's it's an in an, an intense traumatic experience having a child. Right? You're going to remember that for all of your life. This is so much easier than that. Giving spiritual life to your children is so much easier and more enjoyable. And it's a day to connect with family. It's a day to connect to your parish community. It's really, and I've, I've been a deacon for only about a year now. The best times that I have with people are our baptisms baptisms and weddings are the best um because it's a time to celebrate invite family right invite people invite friends from work right we got room no no big deal invite people to partake in the day because your child is now part of the family of god um it's such an incredible witness of our melkite faith to everyone else when we have a baptism because there's so much rich theology there's so much joy and celebration that if you're questioning well i don't know about this person you know maybe they're you know protestant and they're not going to just invite them invite them okay we're not we're not looking to like convert people that'd be nice but again kind of dipping you know their toe into that that rich theology and this celebration it's it's worth casting a wide net. So make it a day of celebration. Make it a day of joy. Um, because now they're home. When your child receives all the, those sacraments of initiation, right? St. George, Melkite, Greek Catholic Church is their home. No doubt. They're a full member of the church. They don't have to do anything else. They're a fully initiated Christian, which is amazing. It is amazing. And then all the other sacraments, they're welcome to. The door is wide open now for them. And so it's really, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you remember, you know, have people take pictures, people there to celebrate with you. It's It's so important. It's so important in, in your life and in the life of your child. Any questions? I know it's the fire hose, right? It's a lot of information, but, you know, you guys probably knew a lot of it anyway. But if you have any questions, and if you think of anything later on down the line, drop me a line, talk to your dad, call Father Justin, because you don't want to talk to your dad. Um <laughs> You know, it's it's all good. We we really we want you guys to enjoy the day and we want you to enjoy your child's growth and development in Christ. That's the whole point. So I got nothing else. Anybody online have any questions? No. Hey Michelle. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Stop the record.